All right, ladies and gentlemen, hello, welcome back. It's another episode of Professor Drew's Lab. Y'all have some more questions. I have some more answers. Let's jump right down to it. Matthew Turner has one single burning question. Where were the combies of the Three Bees Trading Company sending their sales revenue? You describe them putting money in a mailbox and I just have to know. It's being sent to a trainer or maybe their beloved mama Vespaquin somewhere. Just want to know what those adorable little bees are up to. Uh, in my mind, they are independent business owners and they operate within the safety of Nutri Sanctuary where they can be safe and happy. And they sell organic honey and their hope is to like someday own like a big farm full of other combies where they can just chill and be friends. Um, that's my hope. That's my hope for them. Um, hopefully they get there someday. I mean, they, they're making a killing selling all that honey. So fingers crossed, right? Moving on down, Fire of Hades wants to know, what Pokemon on each player's team do you think will end up the strongest for each player? I know their starters are pretty strong, but they might not end that incredibly strong. How would you deal with that kind of strength? So definitely for CJ's team, I think Wimpimble's got uh, the makings of like the strongest uh, for the team. Absolutely. Um, kids got chops. Uh, Arjan for Milo, absolutely. Uh, same deal. I think I think his uh, chef prowess is really just going to catapult him into being an incredible Typhlosion. Uh, drip for Bentley. I mean, when that dude finally hits Blastoise, it's going to be crazy. Uh, Pontiki's already the strongest for Phoebe. Um, so maybe Shirley might might step up there someday. And uh, Neek for D, 100%. Um, can you imagine a, 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 a Sceptile with tinkering abilities? It's going to be nuts. Um, but as for, like, how do you deal with... Super high level D&D, I'm learning on the fly. <laughs> it's the highest level campaign that I've run. It's easily the longest game I've ever run. Um, and it's it's awesome and it's great. But each, each new encounter um, becomes a new test of like, why are they so strong? How did I make them this strong? So it's, it's definitely a challenge. But the way I've been getting around it is not making combat just be combat you, you have to challenge your players more than your characters because you like the characters can handle anything i can throw at them so i need to find a way to make things difficult for the players more than what's on their sheet so if i can challenge the person sitting at the table and not the character running around in the world that's the balance that i look for uh, because that's more fun if they're solving puzzles to do a combat it's a little more fun than just a, a cut and dry beat them up, something like that. So that's kind of how I handle it. Um, as for like a genuine answer to your question, the starters are definitely really strong, but it's because they get the most screen time, for, for lack of a better word. Um, I do think Titania for Milo's team is someone that we're seeing really like rise to the occasion, which I didn't expect from the beginning, but he's got so many great ideas for her that I think it'll be hard to prevent her from becoming like incredible um i could see manny really like just accelerating and taking off rose is already very strong um nipsey's formidable in their own right obviously um again their starters are crazy good but there is there is a limit and they're based on how we balance things the later they caught something and the more they're using it now the faster things are accelerating so I honestly, I don't know. Um, that's a that's a very good question, though. I think Claremont or BB also have the potential for Phoebe's team to just really be insanely strong. Um, and I think Mute, Mute's going places, man. Which again, starters. But hopefully that kind of answers your your question, both as in a in a joking way and also a legitimate way. But let's move on down. Macho Mostly Magic has a question. I have a question regarding shiny mons. As far as I can recall, Ben's Yanma is the shiny that has been given a spotlight, so to speak. Is there any rule for encountering them? Figure since there are variants of some mons that the whole idea of a shiny is hard to implement since there are a lot of different colorations. You are bang on the money. Um, I never set out with the intention of having like a, ru a rule for shinies. Um, I honestly didn't think I was going to use them at all because like when? When do you do it? And honestly, Evanrood happened before I really had the idea to do like widespread variants just to keep things fresh for me. 
Um, cause it would, I felt like it would have been kind of bland if everything was always a standard issue thing. And it wouldn't make sense for how I have the lore set up of like how the creatures have mutated and gotten all these crazy cool abilities. Just wouldn't really have made sense, but, um, I didn't and still don't have a rule for like when something should be shiny. Um, there are two shinies in the game that I can think of offhand. There's Pontiki and there's Evanrude. Um, but it's kind of hard to tell with Pontiki because the color palette is meh. But that's that's honestly the reason a lot of things don't show up shiny is because a lot of the shinies are just the same exact thing. So part of why I made the variants so different is I wanted a way to have my own way of doing shinies, but be able to showcase them more readily and also keep it fresh for the players and keep them on their toes. Because a lot of the players, as we've said before, know a lot more about Pokemon than I do. So I wanted to make sure that I could surprise them uh, without them just knowing everything I'm going to do before it even happens. But yeah, hopefully that kind of answers your question. Um, D-Swag, you've got a you got a bunch of questions, so let's tackle a couple of them. I know that you've talked about how much you enjoyed the Tots exploring. You wrote Ediola, I think. I think you mean Watalonga. So I'm going to talk about Watalonga. So hopefully that's right. I know you've talked about how much you enjoyed the Tots Exploring Watalonga because the players had a hand in making it, but would you ever, or have you already done that with any other towns or points of interest with the players, or would you have the viewers toss ideas your way? Um, I absolutely will have the players do that in the future. Um, I'm not going to make them do it for every town because they don't have as much time as I do, um, but Absolutely, they are on the clock <laughs> when it comes to world building stuff. As for would you have viewers toss ideas your way, I do world building streams over on Twitch. Um, the The link to that is, is everywhere. It's everywhere all, all the time. But um, I want to get those more regularly, but it's kind of hard to like schedule a time to be inspired to world build. So if it comes time for like a, a game two, with the Tater Tots group or plus or minus other people, I don't know. Um, in the future, we will absolutely we'll do some world building streams for it. Um, the players, a thousand percent, will have more say. Uh, but I have no issue having some viewer suggestions thrown in there. We've done it a lot for the, for the Tots. When it looked like they were going to do some, like activity board, job board style things. We did crowdsource that as well. It just never quite took off the way it looked like it was going to. Um, it looked like the players were gonna handle a bunch of jobs and then they just sort of did a couple and moved on. And then the game has just accelerated so fast from there. So that one kind of fell flat, but we had the idea to do that. Um, but it's, it's very difficult to pass the reins off because I've already brought the players in to build stuff, but I have no issue with like having some crowdsourced ideas. Um, it just, it might be like one town. There might be a town that we make in like a stream or something in the future, but never say never, but it, I don't know. I don't know right now. For the Larius region though, we're kind of stuck because a lot of that stuff is already kind of done and done, but it's always changing. Moving on down, with how you have described the way you run legendaries and then basically being gods with powers that their followers would envision them having, would it be possible for a religion to create Arceus with powers to match? I would imagine somebody already has. Um, there's, there's been a lot of, um, there's a lot of little cultural differences and stuff that I've kind of plugged into the game. But again, we, like when we started the Tots game, I took religion, arcana, and animal handling off the character sheets. We just we just didn't interface with them because the players had never played before and I wanted to keep things from getting complicated or, or difficult for them to understand. And when we set out, I was like, well, we'll probably not do any magic here, so we won't worry about Arcana. And then, you know, five sessions in, I go, you know, it'd be kind of cool if we had these big spires of magical rock. Might have been a great thing to have an Arcana check for. So we started bringing those back in. So um, I think we're in too deep to start adding like religion checks in there. So those usually just get lumped into history or just straight intelligence anyway. But that's a, that's a very rambly way of saying like, yeah, it would absolutely would be possible to do that. 
Um, but it's it's not as one to one as I think I've described it, because it, the the way it seems to be coming across is like okay, if if like 500 people get together and they go okay, we want this being to do this thing, it won't work. Um, it's it's tens of thousands of people believing in earnest, so it's like their actual genuine faith is what is creating these things, because there's not like a catalyst bringing them about. It's just the belief in them. Um, and I really wish I could find like the term that it is. I'm fairly certain it's actually just called like manifestation and I'm just way overthinking it. But there's a there's a, a school of thought for like Tibetan monks where they believe like if you believe in something you can make it happen. And I'm pretty sure that's what it is because I think I'm just overcomplicating it. And anyways, all of that to say, I thought it was a cool idea, so I brought it in there. Um, but it's much like every D&D &D idea, as soon as you pitch it, um, someone is going to find a way to break it very quickly. Um, so then you kind of have to alter your ideas. But that's that's basically how they worked since the beginning, because I hate the idea of a 10-year-old going out and catching the embodiment of space and time, because I, I just hate it. I just hate it. So. That was the way I found to bring those in because you guys want to see them and the players get excited when they see them. Uh, but n to not have to worry about somebody rolling up with like a grout on because I don't want to deal with that. <laughs> All right, let's move on down. Let's move on down. Were there any Pokemon that you presented to the party that you were surprised that they didn't try to catch? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I can't even give you one example because there's been a lot. There's been a lot of Pokemon that I kind of designed with a player in mind, and they either ended up on someone else's team or nobody's team. Um, like Natu, Larvitar, um, Wimpimble was was written with uh, Milo in mind, but just caught CJ's attention, and, and there we are. And I'm not I'm not bitter about it at all. If they if they don't catch them, they don't catch them. Um, they've been very open and discussing uh, their reasons for catching certain things and not trying to catch other things in later sessions as they've gotten more comfortable. Um, if you already have like 25 guys on your team and you only use like six, it's it's kind of a hard sell to catch another one. And they've said because they all have personalities and they feel more real and alive, they feel bad about just putting them in a PC forever. So once you hear it that way, I mean, there it is. But they are still seeking out a couple things, but it's, it's definitely a a snag going from a video game aspect to like I don't know, a tabletop RPG aspect where you go from okay I'm gonna I need this type matchup for this gym and then never again so I'm gonna go catch a thing to beat this gym and then put it in a PC box they feel bad doing that in like a DD and d context which is totally fine it's their prerogative but that's definitely uh, that's definitely been the reasoning that I've I've heard from them the most is they just, they would feel bad, and they don't want to, like, catch and release to just beat a gym. So, yeah. Anyways, moving on down, a bonus question. Out of curiosity in designing Garchomp, which we did at the end of the last lab video, uh, would you give it a fly speed, like in the Pokedex, or would you want to lean into the Sand Shark design because physically it makes more sense? So I, I am unfamiliar with it having a fly speed in the Pokedex which should tell you a little bit about how, I, how else I design these Pokemon. Um, I don't look to the dex entries at all, ever, because they're just so, like, grossly inconsistent and exaggerated, and on different scales and, and like, so hard to keep track of. So, contrary to how I used to run D&D before the TOTS game, I would grab a monster manual, and I would flip through until I saw art that was inspiring, and then I would read a little bit of the lore and kind of figure things out. Um, best example I have is like hags, right? They have like a three paragraph blurb on why hags are super cool and where you would find them and a good plot hook to use them in. Uh, Volo's Guide to Monsters did a great job of expanding on all that. Free plug for those guys. <laughs> Not that they need it, but that's how I used to build stuff, but the Pokedex entries don't work at all <laughs> for that method, so I had to kind of move on. So instead of doing that, what I usually do is you just come up with what you think the creature should be able to do, make a variant that can do that, and move on. Keep it simple. So I would definitely lean more into the Sandshark route for Garchomp rather than giving it a fly speed. 
because I can't justify that thing just like taking off into flight. I don't see jet boosters or anything on there. But again, totally fine. If, if you guys would, uh, would put a fly speed on Garchomp, more power to you, man. More power to you. Go for it. Let's move on down here. Uh, Christopher has a question. So I found a homebrew someone had made for Pokemon D&D a while back. I myself am a huge Pokemon fan, your son is as well. That's awesome. Noticed in the second episode of the Laris region, uh, the cards the players had in front of them, or what looked like their characters as well as their individual Pokemon. I was wondering if I could maybe get a template, or if you had some pointers for how to make a simplistic yet organized character sheet and note cards for your players, and or a program or software that could help with that development. Oh my goodness, I'm so glad you asked. So we haven't filmed it yet. Joel and I are looking to sync up our schedules at some point, but we're both exceptionally busy and tired right now. So one of these days, hopefully someday we can I can snag him for like two hours. We've been very hard at work, and by we I mean Joel, because he's the programmer between the two of us. And I say that with all of the love and respect that I can. Um, he just knows how to work Excel really, really well. So we've we've graduated from those little note cards, and I wish I had one here so that I could just show you what we used to have. Um, but we are going to do a little walkthrough video um, in the next couple weeks, hopefully, of our, our way of doing things now, because it's a lot more efficient. Um, how to how to program the, the things and how we did stuff and why things look the way they do, what our character sheets look like. It's not going to have stats or anything on there, but there will be a, a I hesitate to call it a guide because we haven't filmed it yet. I don't know exactly how it's going to function. Um, but stay tuned for that. We will do a walkthrough of how we handle our stuff and how it might help you handle yours. So stay tuned. We will, we will do that for you. If I had one of the old note cards here, I would absolutely, I'd just pop it up and show you. But they're all at the studio. So I'm sorry. But stay tuned. Stay tuned. I don't have a hard release date for it because we haven't filmed it yet. But soon. Someday soon, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Let's move on down. Shiro, you have a couple more questions, so let's tackle some of these. These are going to be a little bit quick because there's not a whole lot I can say about them, but I will touch as many as I can in as much detail as is possible. Here we go. Did we ever find out what exactly made Dunlock die and what Wadsworth saw in his head? We did not, um, but we, we did get some hints and some allusions to the reasoning of why. There are some hints in that scene. Feels weird to call it a scene, but I guess it is a show. So there are some hints in there as to what happened, but I have never told the players exactly what happened. Um, because they've never really been able to figure it out. So, who knows? Maybe someday. That might be a, a, a Pearly Gates question that I can finally answer. I'm also curious about who Spencer and Gerhard are. Like, how could Spencer work in the Soul Forge if he was a ghost? And who was the Gerhard they actually met when Mr. We Have Its Feet blew up the house? Stay tuned. Um, ghosts are very good at pretending to be the people and things that they are not. Which is a phrase that comes up a lot. Um, so again, that might be a Pearly Gates question someday. I can... Maybe, oh god, it's gonna be so cool if I can ever just actually, like, talk about stuff. Because it's... It, it might be really cool, it might be really lame for you guys to, like, find out exactly why certain things happened and... Yeah. Moving on down! Uh, what we hear in the Nutri Gym about Monty, the Tracker, and Milo's parents. Was that Milo's fears or closer to reality? It is absolutely Milo's fears. So Nutri Gym is designed to bring your deepest, darkest, innermost fears to the surface. Um, things that like your friends and family don't approve of you or the things that you're doing or that you don't measure up to some marker that's really important to you. So for Milo, it was his family's disapproval of Monty. Um, and that deep-seated fear of, like, why? Why don't they approve of him? He's just as good, if not better, than all the other birds that we train. So why don't they approve of him? Is it just because he's my friend? Is it, is it that they just distrust him? So Nutri Gym was designed to take that core fear and prey on it. And just really kind of break him apart. But Milo caught on pretty quick, kind of unraveled at the seams and kind of figured out that everything wasn't quite what it looked like. So that's what, like, Nutri Gym was definitely meant to challenge the players more than the characters. And that's probably the best example I have of, like, how that can work for you. So everything that you saw in the Nutri Gym is not, like, canon. 
It's just what the players think that their characters would have seen. Amped up to a million. Whatever they told me they were afraid of. That's kind of what showed up. But moving on down, since CJ no longer has the tombstone, can Mana read his mind now? Uh, Mana is still unable to read CJ, uh, but is at a point with the Tots where she does not try to read them because they have shown her who they are. So she doesn't have to read them anymore. But that's, a, that's kind of a cop-out answer, but basically, yes, she was unable to read it because of the tombstone, but there are lingering effects to, to wielding such an artifact. Moving on down, what's the connection to the Firstborn in Ragnarok and the Prime Mind? A distant ancestor spread across space and time, my friend. Um, until we really dive into, and we may never, I don't know, uh, but until we really get like a full dive into who the Prime Mind is, or what the Prime Mind is, or how it works, um, it's kind of hard to say. The Firstborn was an idea I had for one of like seven villains that Ragnarok could have gone with. Um, and that's just the one that the players gravitated towards, I think because of the correlation to the Prime Mind. So, who knows? Um, we might we might get to see a little bit more of that in the future, but until then, who knows? Who can say? And last but not least for this video, we have... You told us that your take about legendary and mythical Pokémon, what's your take on the ones that embody concepts? Like Mewtwo, Lugia, Shaman, or the Three Birds. How would they exist in the Laris region? Would they just be strong, rare Pokemon, or also similar to a Primal? Um, so we've seen the legendary birds and how they function in the Laris region. Um, well, I, they've been alluded to. They were in a children's book. <laughs> but we did see the Icebringer. Um, that is how they will function. Um, it is very unlikely, given the sort of scope and trajectory of the Tots game, that we will see something like Mewtwo, given the traditional origins of it, and kind of how it functions with like genetic splicing and stuff. That's not really a route that we've gone, so it probably won't show up like that. Um, something like Shaman or Alugia, where canonically there can be multiple of them. Um, who knows? I have, a, I have a list, there's fewer than 10 legendaries that I intend to even allude to for the Tots game. So it's very unlikely that we'll see all of them. We might never see another one. We might see one or two more. Um, it's kind of hard to say. Um, it just depends how the how the tots kind of go about certain things and how they handle whatever they're going to handle. But in an effort to not potentially spoil anything, um, how would I handle them? They would function exactly like all the others. Um, anything legendary or mythical is going to function in the sense that it can't be caught. Just because that's just like a... a internal feeling that's always bothered me about the the games and the and the movies and the show and stuff is if you could just go out and catch like a lugia you just kind of win <laughs> the whole thing and if you have a pokemon with like a 26 ac and 2 million hit points that hits for like 30 d12 you're never gonna use anything else and so nothing will ever challenge you it's it's very difficult to challenge you if you have something that cool or that strong or or however you want to phrase it but Let's get down to business to design Amon. So, we were gonna do Han Edge and Dewblade and Aegislash, and then I realized I haven't made those yet. <laughs> and that's on me. So what I'm actually gonna do is Bookworm asked if I would make a Golet and Golurk, and also talked a little bit about like some lore-related stuff, and I said, you know what, that's a great idea. So let me walk you through those guys for this week, and then... Hopefully I can find some time and, and actually like finish up the V2 decks. I got about 170 more, I think, because the list keeps growing. I'm in the I'm in the low 700s. I'm getting there. I'm getting there, man. I'm getting there. All right. But let's talk about Golet and Golurk because I agree. They're also, they're very cool. I like them. So they have Iron Fist where their melee attacks, their fist attacks do additional damage. So I would just give them a bonus to like attack and damage rolls. Um, if it has punch in the name, I would just give them like proficiency bonus, extra damage, maybe an extra die depending on the power level of your setting. Um, they could have klutz where they can't use the held item. Easy peasy. They either can't gain the benefits of it or they can't hold one. There's clumsy. Maybe there's brock, like they just drop it all over the place. Uh, no guard is a very difficult 
ability to use in D&D terms. So there's a tendency for folks when we talk about it in like streams and stuff to say that if a Pokemon has no guard in a D&D context, you just always hit and they are always hit. But there are abilities that would be problematic with that. Um, I'm not even mentioning like the the guaranteed uh, knockout moves, like Fissure or something, hitting something with no guard. I'm worried about if if you always hit, you can't challenge that player. Because if you always hit, they, they no longer have to roll. But they also, like, they can't crit. They can't crit fail. You always hit. Um, so I handle no guard like a reckless attack for a barbarian. That's the way I would do it. Um, you're twice as likely to hit because you get a second shot at hitting, but you're also twice as likely to be hit because they have advantage attacking you. So it's just a mutual advantage. That's how I handle no guard. However you handle it in your game, totally fair. Um, but for the power level that I'm shooting for, I'm not okay with something always hitting and always being hit because you, that's a guarantee that somebody is being overpowered and also very likely to be killed very quickly. And those swings might be fun for one of your players, but I don't think it would gel well for any of mine. But let's look at some attacks here. Um, I would start Golet with Astonish, because you got to have a little bit of a ghost move. Um, Monty's got this, so you guys have kind of seen how I handle it in action. Um, slight bonus to hit, very low damage die, um, but a 25% chance to flinch. And your rules for flinch might uh, vary from mine. I've changed mine a couple times, from being like stunned until the start of their turn, stunned until the end of their next turn, um, things like that. Because it's kind of hard. It's it's very strong. It's like having a, a stunning strike monk in a party and you're like, please stop stunning my, my big bad. It, he can't do anything. Please, please leave him alone. Um, to play into the opportunities for Iron Fist, I would start them off with something like Shadow Punch. Um, I have a couple rules for a couple ghost and dark moves where if it's at night or if you're in shadow or something, you have advantage or extra damage. Um, I do have Defense Curl on for Golet because I have the AC set relatively low. Because the speed is so bad, I have the Dex lower. Which is something I've been investigating how to fix, but to counteract that, they also have an incredibly high strength. So that's usually... I tend to run the Pokémon closer to, like, a point-buy system. Even though that's not really at all how I do it. I will kind of fudge the math if something is so comically slow or has really low intelligence or something, I will counteract that by giving its main stat a little bit of a boost. But usually a first stage Pokemon isn't gonna have higher than a plus two. So we bump that up to a 15 and we'll get into the stats in a second, but long story short, I would give Defense Curl. I would let that stack a couple times and last for a minute and not require concentration. That way you could set up and get from 9 up to like a 12 AC, um, which is not too bad in the newer system that we're kind of veering towards, even though we're not going to see it in the TOTS game. But that's kind of, that's that's where my brain is headed from a design standpoint, so that's kind of what, that's kind of the route we're going to discuss for today. Um, and then Mud Slap, I would have that be a, just a cone. Small cone, like 15 foot. Um, relatively easy to dodge, low damage because it can hit multiple things. Um, I'm trying to avoid like accuracy drops because um, they're they're in they're in the tots setting and they're very difficult to remember. Um, I do have those little rings now, which helps a ton. But I mean, we're like Williams got sand attack and it's like a 30 foot cone and it puts everybody at disadvantage and that seems really 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 strong. So short of having like a really good effect that's really easy to dodge or having like an average effect that's harder to dodge, it's a little tricky. So I would just keep that as a, a low dexterity saving throw or you take a little bit of ground damage. Kind of go that route instead. Because I like for everything to have like an AoE, a, a weak hit with a status and then like a stronger hit and then some kind of tech they can do. So let's... Taking what we've heard from that, let's jump down to Golurk. I would bump Astonish into Phantom Force, um, let you move uh, part of your speed 
or up to your speed as part of the attack, rather. Um, and if you move a certain distance, you can't reduce or resist the damage in any way, um, unless you are immune. So if you hit a normal type with it, if those are the rules you're going for, it wouldn't work. But if you move like 10 feet, it's kind of like the charger feet. If you start running, you can appear behind them and smack them. As part of that, I would keep the damage die at a d4, but just give them three. So it'd be three d4. Um, that way you can appear behind them. Because again, these all allow for if you found like a wild Golurk. These are the stats I would use for like the Tots game. If they ran into something that I hadn't made for the old, the old decks, I would pop in here. Probably grab something like this. Um, I would bump Shadow Punch. I would just give it an additional uh, bonus to hit and another die of damage. Because same deal. I like the Pokemon in here to have a base point where you can springboard off as they level up and progress through your game. You don't want to start them really, really strong. So that's that's kind of why we did Greninja the way that we did. Because I know a lot of you were like, oh, I would do a higher damage die and stuff, which is awesome. I encourage you to do that. Um, these are just like baseline ones. If the Tots were to catch one, we would absolutely it would be customized to to oblivion and it would be way too strong <laughs> but that's how i that's how i roll um curse i've gone a few different routes in the past this is the one that currently has me the most excited is you deal damage to yourself which is how curse works um so you take an amount of ghost damage which is super effective to you so you would take double um but a creature that you can see within a certain range suffers force damage at the end of each of its turns until it's dead or recalled which is really good, but you also have to hurt yourself a lot. Um, and then bump Mud Slap up to Earthquake. Much higher uh, saving throw, slightly bump the damage up, and then uh, flying type Pokemon or things that aren't on the ground are not affected. Probably does double damage to structures. Uh, but let's look at some stat blocks. We have for Golet, I kind of talked about it earlier, but we'll gloss through it real quick. AC and HP, uh, relatively low, both sitting at a nine based on the stat lines. Um, proficiency bonus, I would start it at a 2. Uh, strength of 15, dex of 8, constitution of 12, intelligence of 7, wisdom and charisma of 10. And I would give it a run speed and a hover speed, because in the, in, the, in the decks and also in the games, you can see they have like little Iron Man thrusters, they can kind of fly around, so... I would have Golette be able to hover, and then when we jump down to Go Lurk, bump the AC up slightly, because the speed gets like marginally better. <laughs> so it goes to 10 instead of 9. Um, hit points randomly being rolled. Throw it at like 93 or something. Uh, buff the proficiency bonus up, probably like a 4. Um, strength goes up to 20 because the, the deck strength is like 125 or something crazy like that. Um, dex of 11, constitution of 16. I tend to put my ghosts at either really, really high constitution or very, very low depending on if they're more tangible or not, and if they have a secondary typing that's not, like, poison. Um, intelligence, 11, Wisdom of 16, and Charisma of 13, because they do get a little bit more intimidating. And they're... I wouldn't say, like, they're super wise, but they do have a pretty solid special defense stat, if memory serves. 30-foot um, running speed, and I would give them a 30-foot fly, buff them from a small to a large creature, because Golurk is big he's very tall but as always i'm curious how you would make a golurk where our ideas would vary because as you've seen the tots game is a super high power level it's like egregiously strong in many cases and i'm looking to kind of squish that back down for any future games if we do another uh, pokemon one in the future i would want things to be much much more manageable much easier to tweak so to speak but yeah i'm curious how you guys would do that as always feel free to keep dropping some questions down below i'll keep answering them as as long as i can and uh and yeah so stay tuned for the eventual walkthrough of our new sheets so i would because i would love for you guys to be able to see all the incredible work that joel has put into this it's amazing um, all the players have access to the sheets on their little tablets in front of them these days, and it's great stuff. Uh, I keep saying it, but we have started filming again, so in case you haven't seen the last couple ones, that might be news to you. 
Um, we have started filming again. That doesn't mean we're going to start posting anytime soon. We do want to get a backlog up, especially with how busy everybody is. There's a lot of a lot of life changes going on, so <laughs> we're all very tired. But we have started filming again. Um, it's by no means is it regular filming, but it's filming. So that's why there haven't been a lot of streams and stuff lately. Your boy's back in the editing bay. So there we are. All of this to say, I love you all very much. Thank you so much for your questions. And keep firing them off, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye!